Hey friends, it's Michael Kingswood back at you again with story time. And if you're watching the video, you can see that once again the background's different. Um, recording this from a new place. I got a place closer to the beach here in the San Diego area, um, which we'll be using periodically. Um, and I figured I'd record from this time, so this place this time. Um, not exactly a scotch glass, but hey, got some scotch. And I'm going to read another story. So it's been a pretty good week overall. Um, Professional-wise in the day job, got a lot of good stuff done. Got a lot of cool, fun time with the kids, with playing with everybody. And had some uh, time without Mommy, because Mommy was off doing... Uh, off the Catalina Island to do some races, uh, road race, and a few other things going on. And I was like, yeah, good time with the kids. We we're gonna go thinking about SeaWorld this, this uh, today, but because uh, it's Sunday today. But it was raining all day yesterday. I thought it was gonna rain again today, and then daylight savings time today screwed everybody's schedule up and realized, nah, screw it, didn't go. Anyway, so now I'm over here and doing some recording while there's still some natural light. That's good. So today, I'm uh, going to do a longer story of mine, uh, a novel at length. If you don't know what that means, when you're writing stories, there's in the science fiction and fantasy realm where I tend to operate. It is defined as a short story is less than 7,500 words. 7,500 words to 17,000 words is what's called a novelette. And 17,000 to 40,000 words is called a novella. And then above 40,000 words is a full-length novel. Now, uh, yeah, full-length being the technical definition. Uh, like my, if you've read my book, Glimmer Veil, vale, that comes in right at about 54,000 words. So that's not a super long book. But it's uh, also, yeah, you know, they get printed out to about 240 pages, 250 pages, so respectable, but not the kind of big door stoppers that you sometimes see in the fantasy lands and, and some of the bigger bigger books out there. Uh, back before indie was a thing, you know, back in the day, back in the 60s, 70s, uh, they used to print, you know, 50,000 word novels all the time, but in the 90s and the aughts, it basically became a thing where, hey, if you're not writing more than 80,000 words, don't even bother sending it to the publisher in most cases, depending on the genre. Um, but fortunately, now with indie, it, indie publishing, they will do its thing. It's a whole lot easier to get stories of all lengths out there. Now, this length uh, could work for a... The story I'm reading now is 12,000 words, so it's a novella. Novelette, I'm sorry. And uh, it can work for some of the magazine digests out there, like Asimov's Analog. Uh, there's literally dozens of different magazines that will print shorter fiction. Um, and, and I sent this one around to a few places, but eventually I, just, but I decided uh, just to, after, I just decided to do it myself. Because I, frankly, I had a compilation of uh, longer, short <laughs> stories, novelettes and such, and a couple of novellas that I put out called Tales of Adventure, and I wanted to put out a second compilation, Tales of Adventure number two, and I had this novelette and another one would have completed up the collection, so I broke off so many of its other places just to fill out the collection because I wanted to. Anyway, this is called A Note of Magic. And it's about a high school girl who plays a clarinet in the orchestra and doesn't know that she's actually channeling magic through her music and communing with some uh, higher powered, uh, spiritual, and kind of angelic beings as part of a uh, struggle against the forces of darkness. And of course she finds that out and hilarity ensues, or maybe not hilarity. Anyway, I think it's a cool little story. Uh, but since it's 12,000 words, I think I told you last time, if you're reading the audio book, you know, the audio narrators will tell you 9,000 words takes about an hour, so it's 12,000 words, so you're probably probably plan on an hour 15 or so and it's longer than I want to do for a video or a podcast so I'm going to break it up I'll do the first third in this one and and then the next two episodes after this I'll do the 
the remainder two thirds. Hope you don't mind, but as it is, it's going to go. This thing's going to go over a half hour, regardless. Anyway, um, that's that's the plan. Hope you enjoy it. I'll be right back in just a minute with the story. A note of magic written by me. Lily wet her lips quickly and rested them on the mouthpiece of her clarinet and waited. The reed pressed against her tongue, its rough texture and wooden taste familiar and comforting as she radiated herself. All around the other members of the McLean High School performance band, more of an orchestra than a band really, had their gazes locked on a slender woman in a white and yellow sundress that set off her graying hair, who stood at the center of the semicircle of her musicians. Mrs. Quigley smiled and raised the baton that she carried loosely in her right hand. Then, with a negligible flick of the baton, the band commenced. It usually did not take very long for Lily to become caught up in the pleasure of performance, all else forgotten but the notes in the sheet music before her, the imagined ticking of a metronome in her head, and the movement of her fingers along the clarinet's valves as she played her part. And today was no different. She played and lost herself in the ecstasy of the moment, not noticing the heat of the bodies all around her, so many that the air conditioning, weak as it was in this part of the school, could not keep up, or the sweat that dripped down her back, making her ruffled blue shirt stick to her skin. The music was all. She played, and it seemed as though a force other than herself sent the fingers over the valves, controlled the quick inhalations and slow exhalations that created the notes that she played. Henry, the spindly freshman who sat next to her as second clarinet, reached over to flip the sheet music, but she paid him no heed. Onward, the music carried her, and she began to feel truly a part of it. It seemed she would float away, carried on her clarinet's tones to a state of pure bliss, pure blight. For a second, she almost thought she could see that light, a beautiful pink-white radiance that bathed over her. And then that second passed, and with it, the oneness that she had felt so clearly. Abruptly, she realized she was no longer in her seat. She stood, alone amidst all the others in the band except for the bassists. Hers was the only music being played, and all eyes were on her. Her last note turned into a squeak and then ended abruptly. She lowered her clarinet, her face growing hot in embarrassment. What was that, Lily? Mrs. Quigley said, one eyebrow raised and went normally past for a stern expression. But her tone did not convey anger, only curiosity and admiration. Lily swallowed and tried to grin, but it felt fake. She glanced around at the other musicians and forced out a little laugh. I'm sorry, she said. I, I just got caught up. Please do so again. That was wonderful. Lily gaped at Mrs. Quigley's words. But, the teacher added, save the improvisation for after Mozart, hmm? Lily nodded and hastily sat down, still flushing. She made a point of rearranging the sheet music on her and Henry's music stand, determinedly not looking anyone else in the eye. How much time was left in this period? She was not sure she would stand to remain there much longer, mortified as she was. And then, as if cued by her thoughts, the bell rang. Half the band stood up and began putting their instruments away. Mrs. Quigley had to wrap her own music stand twice with her baton before they gave her their attention. We have one more rehearsal on Wednesday, and then the recitals on Friday night, Mrs. Quigley beamed a brief smile. Be ready. There was a quiet murmur from the gathered students, then en masse they packed up and bolted for the door. Such was the danger of scheduling rehearsal for the final period of the day. Most of the upperclassmen had missed free periods, an early departure from school, really, to be there, but that did not mean they wanted to rain even a minute longer than necessary. Lily did not hurry, though. Even had she felt up to dealing with their stares, she would not have left with them. She actually liked playing her clarinet, loved it, really. Oh, she had no doubt the others enjoyed band as well, to some extent or the other, but it did not compare with the joy she took from it. That was obvious. So she always remained after for a while. She raised the clarinet to her lips and inhaled. But Mrs. Quigley's voice broke over her concentration. Did you come with that solo part during these little extra sections of yours? Lily looked back at the teacher and found her scaring back at her curiously, her hands resting on her hips. She shrugged. Not sure. Lost track of what I was playing just then. Mrs. Quigley watched her in silence for several seconds. Lily felt the hair on the back of her neck stand on end. There was something odd about the way was the teacher was looking at her, something almost... She could not put words into it, but all of a sudden she felt extremely wary of Mrs. Quigley. 
Then the moment passed, and Mrs. Quickly flashed that smile again. See you Wednesday, she said, and then she too turned to leave the room. She paused at the door and looked over her shoulder at Lily. Practice hard. The door shut behind her with a barely audible click, leaving Lily alone with her clarinet and with the notes. Twenty minutes later, Lily stepped out from the front entrance of the school into the bright warmth of the late spring afternoon and looked around. The student parking lot to the right was mostly empty. Few of the extracurriculars held meetings on Mondays, and there was no reason for most of the upper classmen to remain after the final bell. All the same, a few of her fellow seniors gaggled there, chit-chatting and laughing together. Football jocks, mostly, from the look of the boys and the cheerleaders. Lily watched the empty-headed hussies for a minute as they drew themselves at the muscle boys, marveling at how they could be so transparently brazen without catching any hell for it, as she had ever thought of behaving that way. And, of course, there was Katrina, the first violin, all long legs and graceful curves, her perfect blonde hair tossing as she laughed at one of the jock's words, the violin case tucked under her arm. It was simply not fair. She was everything Lily wished she could be, beautiful, popular, smart, and a brilliant musician. Their eyes met, and Katrina's smile turned slyly vicious. She gestured Lily's way, and a group of the jocks and hussies looked over in her direction. One of the cheerleaders said something, and the group of them laughed, still staring straight at her. Lily made a point of turning left, away from the parking lot and the other students. She lived close enough to walk home. Maybe if she had a car, she would not have had need to go in the parking lot. She was not fleeing from their mocking stares. No, she was not. Or at least that's what she told herself. She turned the corner of the building, leaving the floozies to their victims, and headed down the edge of the athletic field towards her street at the far end of the complex. Off to her left, the baseball team had suited up for practice and was in full swing. Idly, she noted that the cheerleaders did not bother to practice in view of these particular jocks. All but the better for them. She passed the baseball backstop and continued on, her thoughts already leaving the boys and their diversions. A, a tune passed through her head. She recognized it from earlier when she had gone off during rehearsal. It had seemed so clear then, but now it echoed through her memory like a dream half remembered. She knew that tune somehow, but it vanished as soon as she tried to take a hold of it. She should be able to hum it, but somehow it eluded her, the notes flitting out of her mind as soon as they came. What was... Something slammed into her and she fell forward onto the turf, letting out a high-pitched yelp that sounded horrid in her own ears. She threw out her hands to catch herself, her book bag flying wide from the effort, but only managed to land jarringly on her left wrist. Damn, that was all she needed was to hurt herself before the recital. Something heavy lay atop her and she had to squirm to get out from beneath it. She rolled over onto her back, working her wrist gingerly and biting her lip, both from the pain and from the effort of holding back a salty curse, one of her mother's boyfriends had let loose one time. A boy rolled the other way. It must have been he who landed atop her, and she scowled. What do you think you're... The words cut off in her mouth as the guy pushed himself up onto his hands and knees and looked at her, concerned on his face. She recognized him immediately. Josh Harrington. Her stomach did a little flip in her belly as his bright green eyes met hers, and he flushed with embarrassment. I'm sorry, Lily, he said, getting to his feet in a hurry and offering him, her a hand up. I didn't see you there. She should have snapped back some witty retort, but right then all thought left her as she looked up at him. A few strands of his dirty blonde hair hung out dashingly below the brim of his ball cap, and his practice uniform was grass-stained where he had landed on the turf. On her! She forced down a little shiver as her mind tried to take that thought another six steps farther than it should have. It's okay, she managed to say, and started to her feet. She took his hand, not wanting to refuse the effort at politeness, and a second later, almost wished that she had not. A little jolt of excitement, almost electricity, seemed to run down her hand into the rest of her body at his touch, and her legs stopped working for a second. She half collapsed back to the ground before she caught herself and got back to her feet. She turned away so he would not see the flush she felt running through her cheeks, and looked around for her book bag. Oh, there it was, off to the left. And next to it was a baseball. I guess I made you miss your catch, she said. He was an outfielder. It was not good for him to miss catches. She hoped he would not get in trouble for that. Sorry. Josh laughed softly. Bounding past her to scoop up her book bag and his ball, both. He turned back to her, an easy grin on his face as he held out her bag for her. Not the first time. How many girls had he run into out here? Are you all right? 
She was about to nod, but right then the alarm on her watch went off. She glanced down, surprised. She did not remember setting the alarm, then she saw the time. 3.45. Something shifted within her. A force seemed to shove her aside within her own head, and everything went black. She needed to hurry. She was almost late. She snatched the bag away from the boy, murmuring something she had no idea what, and spinning away from him toward the street. She caught a brief flash of confusion becoming irritation on his face before he, before he left her field of view, and then she was off. She covered the remaining distance to the street, then down the five blocks to the girl's house at a run. She burst through the front door and hardly spared a second to glance around the foyer with its gleaming hardwood and sparse, tasteful furnishing before dashing upstairs. She had not announced herself. The mother would not be home from work for some time. She got to the girl's room and kicked the door shut behind herself, dropping her book bag in a heap on the floor. A quick scan showed everything still in place. The double bed, neatly made with white lace blankets off in the corner to the left, the writing desk beneath the window at the foot of the bed, the dresser against the wall to her right, and there against the wall directly ahead, the music stand. A rush of relief flowed through her. Nothing had been disturbed. More slowly now, she lifted the front of the mattress up, the foot of the mattress up, and pulled out a bundle of paper from its place of concealment. She flipped through it and, spying the familiar lines and notes of the music, smiled in satisfaction. The pages were still intact. That thought struck her as silly. Nothing on this earth could destroy these pages or render their notes unreadable. But this was not a game that allowed for mistakes. The consequences of error would be disastrous beyond the understanding of the simple people around her. She set the sheet music on the music stand, feeling the weight of her burden distinctly, as she always did when she prepared herself. As she assembled the girl's clarinet, she spared a glance at the watch. 3.55. This would not do. There was no help for it. She finished her preparations and set the reed to her lips, her eyes focusing on the first note as she gathered her will. She inhaled slowly through her nose, then set to it. The notes came easily, carrying through the room on a wave of energy that made the hair on her arms stand on end. Her skin tingled in a thousand places as the music took her. Pulling her onward almost against her will, her fingers flying across the clarinet's valves, and her breathing strong and steady as she played. This was the spell that had touched the girl in band rehearsal, multiplied a hundredfold, and she reveled in it. And yet, what had happened in the rehearsal gave her pause. That should not have happened. The girl should not have been able to tap into this, not without guidance. How had she brought herself back to the present with a flash of chagrin? Focus. Focus was required now, lest it all go wrong. The music began building in a crescendo that filled the room until it seemed the walls would burst apart. Then, all at once, another series of notes joined her as a lilting harmony that matched and lifted her part to a level greater than she could have managed on her own. And with the expanse of the song, the light from outside, bright and pure on this nearly cloud-free day, faded and dimmed. In the center of the room, a new radiance began to grow. Pink-white, it pulsed in time with the music, beckoning. Weakly at first, but quickly growing more intense in time with the growing harmony, until it seemed she must go blind from looking at it. And then brighter still, it became until it eclipsed all perception, replacing the world she had been in, leaving nothing behind. Nothing but the music. Her fingers were a blur, she could not remember when she had last taken a breath. But she felt no fatigue, no shortage of breath. The music carried her, nurtured her, lifted her up into the vortex of light. She billowed upward, and her heart gave a little jump at the sudden feeling of weightlessness. Familiar and expected though it was, the transition always had that effect. Strange that. She should have been used to it by now. She reached the end of her part of the music and let the clarinet lower from her lips. But somehow the melody and harmony continued on without her. The strands of the song reinforced themselves, each preventing the other from fading, lest the connection be broken. Drifting in the pristine glow, she pushed aside the body's reaction and allowed herself to bask in the sense of warmth, of belonging, of power. She closed her eyes for a moment and just felt. When she opened them again, she was no longer alone. A figure floated in the light before her. It was blurry obscured as though being seen through a warped piece of glass. But it was humanoid, with strong features framed by long, pale hair, flowing iridescent robes, their color difficult to determine in the surrounding brilliance, hung from its shoulders, giving the figure an air of formality. She inclined her head respectfully in greeting. The figure did not speak. Rather, words appeared in her mind. 
You are overdue. I know, she said, voicing her thoughts aloud. The girl became distracted. I was forced to intervene. The features twisted in disapproval. Is she going to be a problem? She paused for a moment, considering, then shook her head. Very well. Report. I am certain I have located the target. I will only need a short time to complete preparations. The figure again looked disapproving. Time grows short. You know the consequences of error. I do. See that you keep them in mind. The figure paused. When it spoke next, it was with greater warmth. You've been apart from us for a long time. Your presence is missed. She felt a flush at the change in tone, and could only incline her head again, more deeply. Have you anything else? She considered mentioning the incident during the girls' music rehearsal this day, but decided against it. There was nothing she could not handle. Nothing to worry about. She shook her head. Very well. Report again in two days and be prepared to complete your task quickly. The figure was back to formality and command. Much depends on your success. She inclined her head again in farewell this time. Then, with a flash of brilliant white, the connection broke and the figure was gone. What's going on in here? Lily gave a start and almost fell off the bed. She blinked her eyes, bringing them into focus, and sat up, confused. Her bed? What was she doing on her bed? The last thing she could recall was picking herself off the grass when Josh had run into her, and the way the sunlight glinted in his eyes, she shook her head, suppressing the thought, and looked over toward her bedroom door, where her mother stood with her hands on her hips, staring at her with a mixture of concern and irritation. Mother was everything Lily was not, tall and willy, willowy, while Lily was short and, how did grandmother say, big-boned. Mother's hair was dark, just a shade less than black, and she wore it up, giving her an elegant but businesslike look. When matched with the dark pants suit that seemed to both show off her curves and conceal them at the same time, she spent plenty of time at the gym to keep herself looking that way, Lily knew, but, and Mother would be mortified as she realized Lily knew this, she had also made use of professional help to do so. That's what Lily heard one of the girls at school calling getting plastic surgery one time. You all right? Mother asked. Concern growing on her face as she took in Lily's appearance. Yeah, uh, but was she? She glanced at the clock hanging on the wall above her desk and stopped short. 5.45. She had lost two hours this time. Lily shivered. Several times over the last weeks, she had felt herself sitting someplace or lying on her bed, or unable to account for time. Sometimes it was just a minute or two, sometimes more, a half hour, or 45 minutes. It had made her nervous, but she had never lost this much time before. That was downright frightening. The front door was standing wide open. I thought someone had... Mother stopped, shaking her head. Are you sure you're all right? Lily nodded quickly, not trusting herself to speak just then. Mother already thought her strange. If she knew about the lost time Lily had experienced lately, Lily had no desire to be poked and prodded by a bunch of doctors, or worse, get taken to a head shrink. She had just been very tired and fallen asleep was all, nothing more. That was easy to say. I'm going to get started on dinner. Come down and help? Lily nodded again quickly. I'll be right there. Mother smiled then, reassuringly, and turned to head back downstairs leaving Willie to sit on her bed and try to get her thoughts in order. She was not very successful. Okay, so that's the first part. A little spooky. Something's taking control of Lily and communing with this weird, I don't know what it is, kind of creature that, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, I would be a little freaked out if I was her losing time, too. So, I guess we'll see what comes of it. Sounds like it's kind of an important mission going on. I don't know. And you'll have to wait and see what's going on for the next episode. Because I'm not going to tell you what's going on now. Of course, what you could do is go and get by the story. You can go by my super awesome web store at ssnstorytelling.com slash shop. And there's also going to be a link to the story itself down in the show notes. And you can go and uh, check it out. I think it's uh, yeah, pretty cheap. Of course, you can go to Amazon and these other places too, which, you know, hey, go for it if you want to. I just get more, a greater share of the money if you go to my store, you know, because since I'm all about the money, you can go from there. Or you can just wait till next week. Happily read it to you again too. But if you are just going to, you know, come back and read, uh, 
listen as I uh, read it. That's cool. Just tell other people about the podcast and the video channels. Tell everybody about uh, my stuff and that you like it. And go from there. And hey, leave tips. Throw some crypto on the Patreon. Be a patron. Um, or, you know, however you want to play it. Regardless, I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, let me know what you think one way or the other. And we'll continue on to, with the story at the uh, next episode. Uh, until then, have fun. Don't do anything I wouldn't do.